Hi, I'm Dan DeSantis, the director of the CISO Advisors team here at Cisco Systems. I'm pleased to say that I'm joined today by Trina Ford, the Chief Information Security Officer of AEG Worldwide. Trina, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you for having me, and I'm happy to be here today. Wonderful. So it's been a while since we've seen each other, and, and you know our journeys are always continuing in cybersecurity. The whole point of the conversation today, and by the way, this is going to inspire, I think, a lot of future leaders, is to capture your journey. So would you roll back the clock on Trina Ford and tell us about how you got your start in cybersecurity, kind of what led up to that, and then ultimately became a chief information security officer? Ooh, that's a long wind back. But uh, actually, it started not because I wanted to be a chief information security officer, but because I wanted to be a CIO. Uh -huh. I grew up in IT. I used to sleep on the data center floors. It was all about the Unix, you know, Linux, the 400. It was, you know, pro I was a programmer analyst, a technical project manager. So I aspired to be a CIO. I happened to have an opportunity to be a change management manager because I had that holistic kind of technical background and they were looking for someone who could speak all the languages and yet talk to the business. And as luck would have it, I had the opportunity to work with both internal and external auditors. And I learned that their focus was all about controls that we would have in place as an organization to protect our data you know, our assets. And at that time, it was about um, a compliance, being compliant. So the security programs that we built were more compliance based. And I had the opportunity to launch a security program. And as information and cyber evolved, I heard about, you know, chief information security officers, not just yeah. a CIO, right. a chief information officer. And I set my sights on that at that time. And I knew that my background would allow me to have an opportunity to really get involved in each of the different areas that make up a security program. So I set out to do that. And probably the role that gave me the most visibility to all the different disciplines and areas within a security program was as a chief business security officer. It put me in front of the business. It allowed me to work with both my IT and security peers. And it gave me the background and the experience that I needed to be a successful CISO. And here I am today. Yeah, wonderful. We're glad you're here. We, you know, I, I didn't know we shared this in common. Um, I used to sleep on data center floors too. <laughs> back many years ago. So when I was building ISP networks, I might have spent a few nights on the data center floor. So we have something in common. Um, I, I'd love to drill in, in, in the many aspects of your of your journey. And I know we only have a limited amount of time to get to, to today. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we obviously want to impart or share with the broader community are some of the challenges that chief information security officers are confronted with. Would you share a little bit about some of the challenges specific to, to you and, and your role and some of the things that you've seen out there in the wild? Yeah, I think that my challenges would align to my peers in the different industries. It's always going to be about prioritizing and prioritizing uh, cyber and information initiatives, uh, as well as budget and resources. And I say budget and resources, resources not from the skill set perspective so much, but more from the perspective of COVID set a new standard. And a lot of the candidates and the applicants are looking to remain remote. They want to be completely home shored and considered a remote worker. Some companies have embraced that, some have not. Um, my company is, you know, kind of 50 50 there. So that makes for a bigger challenge when we find great talent. It's a process that we have to go through to make sure that we can either home sure that employee, they can be remote or they're hybrid. So that's a big challenge right now, as well as the budget trying to keep up with our business. Our business has expectations. They're moving at the speed of lightning. Um, they're trying to make sure that they have a competitive advantage they can be a market leader. They want to be the first out the gate. 
And that in itself presents a challenge for a security program because we follow a different path with our budget and our approval. Mm. So budgets, approvals, and then also helping our business to recognize kind of the roles that they play um, with making sure that they have um, a stake in protecting the company. So those, those are some of the bigger challenges that I face. There's plenty of others, but those are the ones that I would say are uh, top of mind for me today. Yeah, and, and you know, if, if misery enjoys company, I mean, we hear this from a lot of CISOs that the talent and the budget conversation are, are, are big ones. One of the other areas we wanted to explore with you is you know how the roles changed. Um, and I, I know when we we did the brief together, we talked about how is it different from say three or five years ago. But I I would say even just in the last couple of years, the roles changing, and we've got this massive macroeconomic change that's happened. We've got a war that's going on. We had things like solar winds and log four J, more regulations, more compliance, of course. And then we have a CISO who's being criminally prosecuted. So so. The world has changed a bit, Trina. And so how does that how does that affect you? And tell me how it's changed a bit for the the role of CISO. Well, reminding me of what just happened to one of my peers is a little scary. So the roles changed in in a way that I've had to take a different approach with both my business and how I actually look to approach cyber. Um, there used to be an expectation, well, there wasn't an expectation on the CISOs. Uh, we would put the expectation on ourselves because we knew the challenges and we were very aware of the threats out there and the risks to our companies. It's changed now in the sense that the expectations is no longer just the CISOs putting the expectation on ourselves, but also our board our partners, um, patrons, fans, employees, they're becoming more savvy. They're paying attention. And now there's an expectation from them that there's a certain amount of due diligence, awareness, education, um, that the CISO of old didn't necessarily have to be as transparent, but there is an expectation of partnership, collaboration, transparency, and then from a knowledge and skill set perspective, whereas being technical was what it was all about a couple of years ago, now it's more about being that business leader. Yes, that technical is important, but you have your boots on the ground and your, your direct reports for that. Now it's about making sure that you can articulate to your board exactly what those uh, threats and risks are to our industry, um, and those that are applicable to the company, what we're doing to make sure that we can stand up a program that will allow us to defend ourselves against. We have to know about insurance. Um, we have to be a risk manager. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, um, there's an expectation that the CISO is, is very aware and has a plan for almost everything. But in order for our CISO to really be successful in today's climate, what we have to do is really partner with our business, our, our vendors, our external partners, to make sure that we are producing and standing up and launching more of an integrated risk and integrated security program. We have to information share and everyone has to understand what their roles are. So, you know, in my opinion, we have evolved to a more holistic view and look as a, a chief of my security officer, and and that's the biggest difference. So you have the benefit. Thank you for that, by the way. You you have the benefit of you know I know I know you have a great network, and and you know I've seen you out there doing a, a couple of different uh, panel discussions and and whatnot. Um, so so less specific to AEG worldwide, and I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that you're a privately held concern. But we're seeing the SEC, for example, uh, talking about, hey, we need to, to make sure that we have some cybersecurity folks on the board of directors for a publicly traded company, having somebody who understands the language that you speak, Trina. So, so you know, you talked a bit about the board conversation. And so what? how do you think that's changed? Do, do, you, do you think the board in general, let me be more specific, is a bit more receptive to the conversation around having a mature cybersecurity program and some of the investment that you need to make it successful? The simple answer is yes. 
and I can speak um, from both you know, experience here and, and elsewhere. The boards are, they're aware, they're listening and they're recognizing that you know, the ways of um, putting the focus elsewhere and, and making the focus not about the board's involvement or the role that the board plays, those, those days are gone. There's an expectation now that the board uh, takes a more active role in understanding their cyber defenses, um, their, their current program that they have in place, and not so much how the company stands up against you know, others, but more along the lines of um, based on the risk that we've determined is specific to our industry or our company, how well are we positioned to defend ourselves against? They're also interested in how well we are um, aligning to any compliance or regulatory mandates. They want to understand how we're using the budget to make sure that we are positioning ourselves to allow our companies to meet their imperatives, you know, um, with minimal risk. You know, I hate to say it by operating securely, but this is what the boards are looking at, and they're also looking to be educated. I think that um, what the SEC is doing is a, is a great thing for the Chief Information Security Officers because it brings about the awareness for the role and what this new climate is, is um, dictating. Mm -hmm. So my board is very aware. We actually have an office of the chair. They're very aware. They're very engaged. Um, we meet quarterly. They want to know what's going on. And what I find that I appreciate most is they want to understand what I need as a chief of main security officer to make sure that I'm, you know, mitigating risk down to a tolerable level for the company. Sure. Makes sense. I, I wanted to, to um, kind of tie back to one of the challenges that you have, which I'm sure, by the way, this in some way comes up even at the board level. And th this goes back to that talent challenge. Um, so I have the privilege of working with an organization where we're, we're going out and specifically in the underserved communities, and we're trying to help build the talent pipeline for cybersecurity. Part of that, of course, is um, making sure that we're attracting a diverse pool of candidates into, into cybersecurity. A lot of companies, Cisco among them, uh, have very big programs tied to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, your general observations on diversity, equity, and inclusion as it relates to building the talent pool. And then maybe if you can talk about how you're fostering that sort of culture at AEG or in your other experiences. Yeah, sure. I um, uh, Diversity, equity, and inclusion comes really easy for me because I know what I would expect when I'm reading a job description or when I'm looking to onboard with a company, I'm reading their website, words are one thing, but when you can genuinely feel it um, and see that the company during your interview process, they believe in it, um, that makes a world of difference. I use my network heavily because I don't just talk about, you know, diversity and inclusion, I believe in it. so. I know if it's at the forefront and a priority for me, I will exercise all avenues. So I do use my network quite a bit. And my network from the perspective of peers, colleagues, and direct reports of mine at one point or time, we've all come across stars. Um, and we, if we act on that and we look back, we can find others to bring along. Most importantly, here at AEG, I've partnered with our employer services and HR group, and they have programs that they've stood up um, for HBCUs, right? Um, whenever there's an opportunity for us uh, to get in front of more junior professionals, I'm always asked to participate in that, and I make sure to do that. I also make sure that I'm linking with you know, others, so that when I'm given the opportunity to share and maybe 
um, pass along someone that I met that I thought was passionate, had the drive that was necessary, I'm sharing that as well. And I've also aligned myself to a couple of councils and forums where we talk about that as well. So I, I do believe that I've covered most of my bases. I won't say all, but I've covered enough to make sure that I can uh, cultivate a team that does believe in and is part of and can show that there's a diverse thought process and that there's also inclusion. Speaking of inclusion, one of the ways that I make sure that my leaders feel included is it's not always about me being in the spotlight. As a matter of fact, I shy away from it. I make the opportunities for my directs to give them an opportunity to shine, give them an opportunity to speak to the, the chiefs and the executives and senior leaderships of our company to make sure that they get the same visibility. Um, we all have to talk about our successors. So I make sure that I do that as well. Yeah, yeah, certainly I get that. I, I don't think I realized that until I became a, by the way, it, it was one of these payback things for me when I realized and I started leading teams that I can help the next generation and, and you know, sort of succession planning, but it was very rewarding. I didn't, I didn't expect that rewarding outcome. Um, uh, there's been a consistent thread in a lot of what you've shared with me thus far around bridge building, around uh, communication and getting other stakeholders involved, whether it's around things like diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it's around, you know, talking to the board or, or, you know, in your previous capacity as sort of a chief business information security officer. Could you talk a bit about, um, you know, let's get a little bit more into the weeds on how you get the lines of business and other stakeholders on board with cybersecurity, because we all know that's not easy because to your earlier point, they want to move at lightning speed. So sometimes they see security as a way to slow things down, um, even though it really can help make the business more resilient. So would you mind sharing a bit about your strategies for getting the rest of the business on board? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's easy for me again, because I like, working with the business. I like the inclusive side and collaborating. So I bring a different uh, perspective to this role here at AEG, especially, but any, any uh, as a chief business security officer, as a, as a CISO prior, I like to engage with the business. So I had to make a concerted effort to make sure that I established my myself, my role, as either a peer in the business, um, as a partner, a true partner, uh, one that can be trusted and called on. I do that in many ways with my business. I have bi-monthly, quarterly, bi-weekly meetings set up with our senior leaders. Um, in some aspects, our legal team, I will meet with them bi-weekly. We have uh, quarterly um, enterprise risk committee meetings to make sure that we continue the collaboration and awareness and transparency. I also make sure, because each business unit has their own IT, I also make sure that I'm partnering very closely with our different IT leaders within our business units, because again, they have a different type of pressure on them. And I wanna make sure that they're aware that their priorities are also a priority for me their agendas and what's important to them is also important to me as a CISO. The, the challenge though that I always run into is that, again, they can move a little faster than, than I can as a CISO with the budget that I have and the resources that I have. So it really comes down to that partnership of transparency and making sure that they understand that regardless of whether we can be there alongside we all have a role that we need to play and that's where that awareness comes in for them as well sure sure um well it seems sounds, sounds like you're a master at it and and i think a lot of folks could could take a page from you on um really how to build a lot of those bridges it's it seems to be i think for many I, I, a lot of the sisters we get to talk to that don't have your communication skills um, and I think this, by the way, is a teaching moment for somebody going into cybersecurity who wants to be a leader someday is working on those soft skills. Uh, we see a lot of amazingly technically competent people coming up through the pipeline, but they're not always focused on their soft skills development, their communication, both verbal and written. 
Uh, so, um, you know, I might, I might send some folks your way that could use some coaching, Trina, if you don't mind. Send them on. With All right. The yeah. Yeah. So, um, Trina, obviously we're going to be posting this video on our public website. And, uh, I, I think, I know you're going to inspire a lot of folks out there with, uh, a lot of the message you've shared thus far. Also inside Cisco, we're going to be watching this video. We're going to be very curious to hear about your perceptions of of the role, but also your perceptions of security vendors, uh, specifically security vendors that you partner with. Would you mind sharing with me what you value? What are the attributes that you value in a good security vendor or a good security partner? No, absolutely. Uh, some of the attributes and that I value is their ability to partner, listen, and their approach. What I mean by that is it's not about the vendor, you know, when you're in a role um, that's responsible for, you know, cyber and security. I won't just say as a chief of base security officer, I'll say as a security leader, our focus is on making sure that we've got the right defenses, the right tech stack, the right technology in place. If a vendor approaches me genuinely uh, to understand what my strategy is, what the vision is for the program, uh, the operating model that I may be trying to stand up and what some of my pain points are, they'll get in the door. And then their transparency around whether they're going to be in a position to help me meet those, the vision or the overall uh, goals of the program, that means a great deal to me as well, because we're not always going to be ready for every technology out there. So they would need to understand the architecture that I'm trying to stand up and build and if they don't have what it takes at that time, what I always appreciate is they don't just say, okay, thanks, bye. Those that tend to actually eventually get in this environment are those that will send something to me, a white paper, or, hey, I've heard this and they send me a link. Have you? Are you aware of this? Or here's this summit. This may be of interest to you or people on your team. Or very similar to, uh, Daniel, what your team does, it's putting other CISOs together with other leaders in, in the organizations and allowing us to, you know, putting us in a forum that allows us to information share um, with, with confidence and without worry, right? Chatham House rules. Yeah. So that's what I look for uh, when it comes down to partnering and or a vendor, collaboration. And also um, I look at how the vendor um, works with, with others, you know, with some of my peers. Um, what do my peers say about those vendors as well? Um, also plays a, a big role in whether I'm going to establish a partnership with the vendors and how the vendor also views you know, integrated security, their role in protecting our organization, as well as my role and my team's role in protecting the organization. Uh, I really appreciate what you're just saying, uh, Trina. A lot of the coaching we do inside Cisco is to make sure that our teams are building bridges across the aisle from the traditional IT and infrastructure and network folks, which is where Cisco is quite comfortable but um, because we're doing a lot of cybersecurity work out there in the industry, we want to make sure that we're coming over to you and say, hey, this investment happened over here. We think it can benefit your security program. So being conversant on both sides of the aisle is, is something that we're really trying to retool our, our sales force here at Cisco to, to understand and appreciate your concerns. Normally, my last question for you would be, if you can go back to your younger self, what, would, what advice? So I, I want the answer to that younger self question, but I also want um, if you don't mind for you to think about, um, there's a lot of young women out there right now, uh, and not just young women, but young people out there right now that might be coming from different backgrounds, um, may not realize that there's a path in cybersecurity for them. What advice would you give them? And, 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 and part of that would be, what advice would you give to young Trina? Okay. So what advice would I give them is probably going to overlap with what advice I'd give young Trina. But what I would tell anyone, whether it's, you know, women, a woman, a man, is that none of us started out as 
well, I should say a while ago without dating myself, none of us started out as, you know, security practitioners. We happened to be in a role and we had the, the skills, the competencies and the aptitude and the ability to move into security. My background was programmer. I was a programmer developer. I never thought about being a, a chief of my security officer, much less put into a security organization. Mm-hmm. So uh, security has evolved and changed. That means that we're, you know, there's diversity in your skill sets that we're looking for as well. The programmers, scientists, right? The data scientists, you never thought about having a data scientist on your team before, um, but we but we do. So what I would say is if, it, if you're passionate about it and it's uh, an area that you like to explore, don't let anything stop you. So that's what I would tell a young woman or a young man who's looking to get into cyber. What I would tell my younger self is a little different. It's, um, you know, find that balance with work and life, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Because you don't get that time back. So definitely find that that balance. It's going to be important uh, later on. And then I'd also tell her, to recognize the difference between the aisle, the fox, the donkey, and the sheep, because she would need to align herself to the owls, watch out for the foxes, and forget the donkeys. There's there's thousands of them out there, and they're always <laughs> going to be around, right? So don't uh, get distracted. And then the last thing I tell her is that she doesn't need anyone's approval. There's a higher power. If it's meant for her and that's part of her path, it will come to fruition. And she just needs to stay stay focused. I think we have a new acronym. So OFDS, right? Owl, fox, donkey, and sheep. Yeah. And so applying that to uh, your career trajectory in cybersecurity, uh, words of wisdom from Trina Ford. Trina, I have about a billion more questions for you, but I know we don't have too much time uh, as it is. So uh, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with me. We, we know you have a day job. Uh, and I am uh, looking forward to the next time we do get a chance to see each other. Hopefully we can get you involved in some of the CISO events that we have coming up. Uh, your voice would be impactful. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you for having me And this. I hope that this resonates across. This has been great. And I do appreciate you taking the time to understand about my journey and giving me the opportunity to share it. Definitely made my day. Thank you, Trina.